Okay. So I'm Tracy Thomason. I am um, a master gardener volunteer for, oh my gosh, 10 years. I was the class. I loved it so much. I went back to school. Right? As a grown up. <laughs> what, do we, what do they call it? A, a non traditional student. So, um, I got to go back while I was also um, trying to start a family. So I got to be pregnant with 20 year olds. I was in my mid thirties and going back to school, which was really fun and exciting because I loved what I was doing too. And it was an adventure. But um, today we're going to talk a little bit about cool things you can do as in a seasonal planter. Uh, so you can achieve a lot of cool stuff um in a planter that you can't keep going in your garden because you can switch it out you can do annuals and when it looks yucky you just pick something new um instead of trying to keep your stuff going through the hot part of the summer <laughs> which we have gotten into um so we're going to talk a little bit about i'm going to start by talking about just some basics for keeping stuff going and and giving everything the best start they can have in a planter and all the things you need to consider and then we'll talk a little um, and that's where the thrills, spills, and fills come in. I'm going to see if I can switch it. These are just some examples of planters. Um, it looks like there's a lot of pansies in there. So that would be a lot, of, a lot more for like spring or fall because pansies are going to be a cooler season plant. They're not doing well right now. <laughs> if you still have pansies out, they probably don't look so great. Um, I am also a volunteer here at the JCRA. These are some, these lovely ladies up front are in my volunteer group. We do, we do some weeding and gardening once a week. So whatever they tell us to do. Yeah. It's very hot right now, but I'm home with a tiny person right now. So I haven't been weeding. Let's see. Is there, um, while, we're, while I'm waiting to get the PowerPoint moving, is there anything a particular wants to learn about today so I can keep that in mind? Like you had your own questions about like, oh, I want to do this. I heard you saying like you're trying to find plants that don't die in the right. heat. Take yeah. We, we can talk about that for sure. Um, it, it is hard right now because we've hit that like, <gasps> part of the summer already here, which usually it's, it's already in May. Well, I don't know. At least we didn't have it in May was my only, sometimes we get like some really horrible stuff, but yeah, it feels like July already to me. And, and we're not quite to that yet, but um, I really hope it rains this afternoon. We're supposed to get a little thunder shower and I hope it rains because the ground's cracked at my house. Um, it's, Okay, let's go ahead and switch it to the first. Let's go ahead and just, if you just tap the, there you go. So the first thing I want to talk about when you're going to buy plants for a container um, or anything, this is kind of more general information for when you're planting, is um, the kinds of things to consider. So you guys have probably seen this. This is what a plant tag looks like generally when you go to like a big box store. Um, so it's going to give you all sorts of care requirements. Uh, usually it'll tell you about the lighting. So that's really important. Like you, where you wanted something that um, wasn't going to just die in the heat. You definitely want to put full sun plants if you're getting hot afternoon sun where you want to put your planter. So that's something to consider. Whoa. Oh, there we go. Great. Yay. So this should just go forward and. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's kind of the first thing on the care tag you need to think about is where am I putting this planter? Um, is it going to be in a shady spot? If it's just going to get morning sun, that's probably where you want to do something that's more like part shade, shade. Um, things that are shade or part shade are not going to be able to handle afternoon sun. They're just going to poop for you. Um, it'll talk about water usage. 
So like, I don't even remember what this plant was that I took a picture of, but see, this says arid or dry, like that would be great for a full sun planter is something that can, is more drought tolerant. Some things are going to need water every day. So think about that too. Um, bloom time is when it's blooming. If you are going to shop at a nursery for your plants, it, that won't be as big a deal because they're selling stuff that's in bloom usually. So if you're ready to make your seasonal planter, all the things that are going to look good in that season are already there and blooming usually. Um, spacing, don't have to worry about it. You're putting it in a planter. <laughs> and it's seasonal. So even if they're crowded, you're, you're going to switch it out for the next season. So by the time it would become a problem spacing wise, you're ready to move to the next season. Uh, growth rate, you don't want to get, we'll talk about that with design. You don't want to get something to put farther out on the edges of your planter that's going to grow too big. So just think about that. Um, and cold hardiness depends on what you want to achieve with your planter. I usually like to put at least one perennial that will last throughout the year. So I don't have to change everything um, in some of my planters. So you do care if it is cold hardy here. So cold hardy uh, just means that it's going to live through the winter time that we have. Um, and it tells you a zone. I'll show you the zone map on the next page. So this says zone two. We are zone 7B. So two is much colder. <laughs> it can handle much colder. Uh, pruning, you don't need to worry about. Fertilization is important um, for a planter if you want them to really keep producing blooms and stuff. But if you're going to use a good mix to begin with for your soil, it'll probably have some time release fertilizer in it already. So you may not have to worry about that so much. So you do care about your care requirements. We are going to think about like what colors we want to put together, um, picking things that are flowering for that season. You do want to get quality plant material because you don't want it to, you know, like you can get cheaper plants, but you don't want them like flag and die on you. Um, sometimes for a, a seasonal planter like that, where you're just trying to have it pretty already, it's worth it to pay a little more for a more established, bigger plant. Um, and then we'll talk about annual versus perennial. I mentioned that a little bit. I usually, yes. You come to the door. Where are you we're 7B. I'm getting ready to show you the map. So, um, so 7B, that's there. Oh. Uh, when you answer questions that are included in person, people online can't hear it. So if you just repeat I'll repeat it. Okay. okay. So, what was your. So, the question is that, that name was said. Uh, I'm, I'm yes. So, where 7B, does that mean that this is true? We could be too hot for a zone two plant. It would probably not do well in our summertime. Um, but we, so the, the gentleman asked about if a zone two plant would be way too hot for us here in 7B. And it could be for the summertime. Um, it might be okay as a shade. If it was a shade plant, it might be fine. If it's something that goes dormant in the summertime, a lot of times if something has its is that cold hardy goes down to such a cold zone. Um, usually it, it, it might go dormant in the summertime, which would mean it would be fine because it would die back to the ground in the summer. So it kind of depends on the plant for that. That's where your, your um, smartphone with Google is really helpful while you're at the nursery. I mean, I still do this every time I go to buy plants. I'll be like, this is really pretty. And then I'll look it up usually by the, um, scientific name if I can find it on there so I can get as much information as possible if I've never grown it before. Um, but this is our zone map. Uh, we are, where are we? Oh, there's Raleigh. So we're the little star up there in North Carolina. So our 7B, which means that we get down, the way they do zone maps is they like average the coldest temperatures. And I think this one tells you this one averages like from when they started recording in the earlier 1900s to 2005, I think is the last one on the, that's currently on the USDA website. Um, so they do the average coldest temperatures in the winter. And so for us, that is five to 10 degrees. 
And that's what they're kind of like guessing what as cold as it could get. And like, frankly, we have not been that cold in many, many, many winters. So you can cheat the zones a little bit as well. Like I have several things in my yard that are in the eight range that have been fine the past few winters. And I just throw some leaves on them (laughs) and make sure they're mulched a little bit because we really haven't hit those single digits much in the past few years. Um, so if you want to, if you want to cheat them a little bit, that's totally allowed. Um, but that is how the zone works on the, on the chart is it tells you kind of, you can leave it out during the winter is basically what we're talking about. Okay, we'll talk about the difference between annuals and perennials. Usually for um, these kind of container planters that are gonna be visually exciting, you wanna use a lot of annuals because annuals are known for, um, they kind of live fast, die hard. They, they make a lot of seed, they make a lot of blooms, but they only live for one growing season. Um, so, they, they tend to be showier than perennials. Um, they tend to have some longer blooming than perennials do. And so some good examples are like pansies. You always see pansies all over the place in the garden centers in like spring and fall when it's cooler. Um, petunias do good right now in the summertime. But that's, that's kind of what you're thinking with annuals. So with annuals, think these are definitely coming back out of this planter for the next season because they're going to be finished and they're not going to be doing anything exciting after this season is over. Perennials come back every year. Um, They are cold hardy. Uh, There are two different kinds of perennials to kind of think about. Um, There are the kind that uh, are more woody that are either deciduous or evergreen like hollies or um, hydrangeas are kind of woody, but they lose their leaves. So they're deciduous. And then there are herbaceous perennials, which uh, can look a lot like you would think of as an annual, but they're going to die back all the way to the ground in the winter because they're herbaceous. They're like softer. and um, But they do have, the herbaceous perennials tend to have some more showy flowers than your woody perennials and stuff too. So those are just things to consider as well. These are just all the different kinds of plants to think about when you're doing this. So let's talk about design. Um, This is a cool little planter. It's got a nice mix of perennials and annuals. Uh, There's like a perennial grass in the middle. Uh, This is called coleus, which you guys have probably been seeing it. It is something you could be using right now in the summertime. It's not gonna be great for your like really hot afternoon sun. They, they can take a lot of sun, but they're not gonna love the like two to four range. Like some of mine get a little sad and droopy during that time. And sometimes it can just depend on how, how much you're willing to water. Like if you're, if you're willing to go out and like soak your planter every morning in July, then you could probably get away with a lot of these things that wouldn't normally love to be in the afternoon sun. <laughs> So we're starting our container. Let's talk about selection for the actual container. There's a lot of different things. You can do what you want. There's no wrong choice. Everybody has personal preferences. I like clay pots just because I like the way they look. Um, But they do have some advantages and disadvantages when it comes to like how the plants do in them. Uh, Clay is gonna dry out faster in the heat because it's wicking water into the clay and then that like increases the surface area. So if it's a glazed clay pot, it's going to be less likely to do that. So if it's got like a pretty color on it, because the glaze is basically melted glass. So that's going to keep your moisture in. If you like the look and feel of a clay pot, you could get a glazed one and then you wouldn't lose so much moisture heat of the day. Um, Plastic is going to hold moisture the best because it's, it's not really poor clay is. Um, and there is wood, wood containers, you're just gonna have to expect to, to replace because they're gonna break down eventually. Um, you could also put pots inside a wood container if you like the look at it, like make a container. You could even use just like 
a plastic um, like landscaping okay. pot. It doesn't have to be pretty if you're going to put it into something decorative. Uh, size and weight, how big do you want it to be? So a lot of times the container might be where I start when I do one at home because oh. I have space. Oh, did you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I had a, a, a space that I want to use a certain container in, you know, like I might pick yellow because it looks good with my front door. So I know it's going to go in this one spot. And after I've established that, I can kind of pick plants based on how much room I have in that container. Um, you can get away with really cramming things together for a, sh a more shorter lived container garden like this, where it's just meant to be beautiful for the season. Like if you were trying to have something exist in this container continually, um, you wouldn't want to cram so much stuff in there because you really would have to water it a lot more and feed it a lot more, but for the season, it's going to do just fine. Um, everything needs to have good drainage. Drainage is really, really important. Um, it, it has to have at least one hole and preferably like multiple or at least a very large one. Uh, Cause you don't want to get like one tiny hole. I, my, my cousin, I was just at her house this weekend and she's like, what happened to my hydrangea in a pot? Like it had been beautiful. And it was, I mean, dead. It was like brown. And she was like, I didn't know if it was the water. We'd had a good rain and it had been in that pot for a few years and it, the soil was just broken down enough. It plugged the hole and it drowned her hydrangea and rotted her out. So like, I really am a big proponent of like really good drainage. Um, we'll talk about that as it come, uh, applies to the medium plants in too. And then also decide if you want like a saucer or pot feet. Um, so a saucer would be like the little clay saucer or plastic saucer underneath. If you're going to have it outside, you don't necessarily need that. Sometimes I put them under things that need more moisture just because it's going to stick around a little longer because it can fill up with water as well. Um, you probably want to do if it's especially on your wood deck, you probably want to do pot feet um, cause they're just little, usually clay feet that stick under your pot. You get three or four of them. It just lifts it off of the ground. So there's not just trapped water under there. That is more for whatever surface. It will help the pot drain a lot better as well, but it, it could really damage whatever surface it's on. If you just sit a pot directly, like concrete's usually not so bad, but you don't want to just set a pot directly, especially if it's pretty flat on the bottom, directly on your wooden deck, or you're going to have like a much darker ring where it was and some algae and some mold. So pot feet are a good idea um, if it's on that sort of surface. Yes. Can you show your thoughts on winter hardiness of pots? A oh, winter hardiness of pots. A favorite place, pot, you know, if you get into a lot of pots, there's... So clay is not ideal. Okay, so um, she asked uh, to comment on winter hardiness of pots. So clay is not ideal for when it's going to be freezing because it is porous. It's going to take on water. And then if we have a really cold night and water freezes, it's, a, it's very likely to crack your clay pots. Um, I still put some clay, like unglazed clay out in the winter because they're not super expensive and I just know they're probably not going to be usable after a few winters. Um, like I'm using one right now where an outer part <laughs> has popped off a little bit and you turn it around. Exactly. <laughs> it's still a pot. It's fine. Um, glazed tend to do a little better, especially if you keep them kind of the, anywhere that's like up against your house or closer to your house, that makes a microclimate where it's going to be a little warmer. Your house is warm. Um, if, and if I especially want to keep something even a little bit warmer um, for the winter, I'll stick it like under where my dryer vent comes out or over near where my heating unit has exhaust and it's warmer. Like it's amazing the kind of difference that can make. Like if you need to overwinter something, in a pot outside, do that without having to like keep it inside your house or in your garage. Um, 
But yeah, for if you plan on keeping something outside for the winter, I use plastic pots usually for that. They're a lot more flexible. Um, you still want to make sure they drain really well because a lot of things, if they get too wet in the winter, are just going to die, even if they can are cold hardy um, because the out of water and then freezing just even plants that are considered cold hardy are not going to love that. So. All right. Soils and substrates. I have a really simple um, recipe that works for me. I just get a, well, first of all, what you're trying to get is good drainage, but also good moisture retention, which sounds counterintuitive, but you can mix things that do both and have some sort of like fertilizer or compost component that's going to give nutri um, nutrients and uh, minerals and that sort of thing. So what I usually do for all my potted plants and all my containers is I mix, um, I just get whatever your favorite, buy something that's potting soil. Usually it already has at least the first two components. It usually already mixes something that will give you drainage and moisture in a potting soil. And um, sometimes they will come with time release fertilizer. So look at the bag. I know like miracle Grow. there are several that have like time release fertilizer already mixed in and that makes it kind of foolproof for fertilization then you don't have to do liquid fertilizer all the time because it a, a time release fertilizer is going to last you a growing season it's usually about three months um so i usually mix one of those potting soils that has a time release fertilizer already mixed in but I add more drainage by putting perlite or vermiculite, um, something to fluff it up even more and help the water really percolate through the whole thing. Because what can happen is if you have too much of that moisture retention stuff in there and it's really hot like it is right now, that stuff's great unless it dries all the way out. And then it's hard to get moisture back in. You almost have to soak the plant in standing water. So it just, I, I find that it just makes it a lot easier to keep things well watered if you add more drainage. So perlite's my favorite. It's like a baked slate, I think. It's, it's white. It's that white, puffy, really light rock that you can, you can buy it separate in the garden section. And um, a lot of the potting soils will already have it in it doesn't matter. Like I still add like usually two to one or so of the potting soil mix to the perlite mixture or some sort of you usually perlite, whatever kind of drainage, but it's just good to have really good water flow and not too much of that moisture retention stuff. So now we get to talk about the fun part, which is picking everything up. Yes, ma'am. One question before you move on. Yeah, sure. I have big pots in front of the house. Like really big, okay. So I would put plastic bottles in the box. Oh, face filler. That is something you can totally do. So she asked about putting um, plastic bottles as a space filler in the bottom of her pot. So if you have really large pots that you want to put stuff in, especially if you're going to put a lot of different smaller things, you don't, it, you don't want it to be too heavy. You also just don't want that much soil mass for the plant because it'll, it could hold water too long. Um, you can definitely do that, especially some of these decorative pots are super tall and skinnier. Like you don't need all that depth with the, the soil just staying moist and the, the roots um, staying in it. So if you do have something that's like, you feel is very large or very tall, um, you can fill space without, um, adding weight doing, you said plastic bottles is a great one. A lot of times you could use like, um, you know, the styrofoam molded styrofoam stuff that comes as packaging around electric or whatever, like that works really well. You can just break it up and it'll, it'll make it lighter. You're not trying to, you still want to have enough soil volume for your plant. So this is something you would do in a container like that where there you just don't need the whole container full of soil. Does that make sense? Like how much if you have a container like this, what is that like 
50 feet maybe. I would do like one layer in a big pot. You don't want to, um, you would want to have one to, it really depends on the size of your plants. But like if you were doing a bunch of pansies or something smaller, you wouldn't need a whole lot of soil on top. But if you were going to keep like a grass that they make um, tend to make deeper roots, you might want to have two feet of soil. And that's, that's not a, there's not a hard and fast rule for that. That's just getting to know the plants. I mean, I, I'm giving you all permission to kill things. That is how you become good at growing things. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, I do it really well. Like, just know that like us gardeners that garden all the kill a lot of stuff. That's how you learn the plant. Like I have to move certain kinds of plants three or four times to like figure out the environment that they really like. Like every now there's, there are some plants that I still haven't figured out. Like I've killed multiple of them and I usually give it a year and I'm like, man, I really wish I could grow one of those. And I'll be like, all right, I'm going to try it in this new spot. Maybe it was getting too much sun. And sometimes that's, it just happens. If something dies, it just means you get to get a new plant, <laughs> which is wonderful. <laughs> so very big container, put something light in the bottom, like space. I mean, some people I know have used like wine corks. I don't have that many wine corks, but yeah. Oh, on the top? Interesting. Using wine corks as a mulch on top. Pine cones. Interesting to keep weeds out. Oh, we're learning some. Oh, yes. I have that problem as well. I have a large indoor house plant that I have to put some plastic spiky things in to keep the, the kitty out. The thing I do is I will take like the pot, the plants, the pot that the plants come in. Yes. And if it's big enough, you can put those plant, those pots down the bottom, not this way up, but upside down. Oh, that's a great idea, and Linda. It becomes, it, it, it 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 okay, so what Linda is saying is for that pot filling idea is plants come in these little plastic um, like greenhouse pots and you've already got them. What else are you going to do with them? She turns them upside down as like a space filler at the bottom and then fills in her soil over that. If she's got a very large container. Just don't cover your drainage. Yes. Don't cover, don't cover your, your drainage. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I would still go around like it would have to, you, you would only do it in a very large container. So make sure they're like around the hole and like, then you could even have soil down towards the drainage yeah, hole. And, and, I, and I, when I, one time I, I, tried, yeah, I was having problems keeping the soil in the plant in the pot because it was so, it was, had such good drainage. Mm -hmm. So I don't normally use landscape fabric, but this would be a place, this is where I had some landscape fabric and I just, over the pot that I had upside down. Oh, to I, slow it down. I just put landscape fabric around it, which kind of gave it so it drained through, but it really reduced the amount of weight. That yeah, had. if you're having too much soil coming out of the bottom of the pot when you're watering landscape, a little piece of landscape fabric down there could help. Um, there's something called um, hardware cloth that's really like this metal mesh. And it's, that's what they use in the bottom of like uh, bonsai pots a lot over the drainage holes because bonsai need lots of frequent watering and have large drainage holes, but very well draining soil. So they'll put like um, hardware cloth you can get at any box store uh, that has a garden section over in the garden section. And it's just like this rolled up metal mesh and um, it's pretty fine. So it works well to keep soil in a pot. You could just cut cut out a little square and put it over your drainage holes. So that's something else to think about. We keep diverging. That's fine. You guys are thinking of good stuff. So design wise, when we get to doing like an ornamental planter like this is you're thinking thriller, filler and spiller. So your thriller is kind of, you're, you're kind of hitting three levels of height and color. Um, so the thriller is usually is whatever your central plan is. It's usually more exciting looking. It's got some height. Um, a lot of times this is where I'll use a perennial 
and then just change out colors, flowering stuff for the season. Uh, this one's a really cool one. This is an ornamental sorghum. They had these this fall at one of the garden centers I was at. Just very pretty. Um, so it's got purple leaves and and it it's not going to be. Uh, this one's actually an annual. Um, it's not going to be pretty past the fall because the seed head will go away, but it'll still be interesting through the winter because it'll dry out and you could you could keep it through the winter if you want to have like that kind of corn stalk dried out look. Um, but an ornamental grass, which is uh, a lot of perennial ornamental grasses, you could would be a great centerpiece for your uh, thriller. Uh, what else did I say? Oh, evergreens. Um, I love a tiny evergreen, like a little tr pine tree or not pine tree, a uh, cedar tree or um, like a Hinoki cypress. They have a lot of really sweet, affordable evergreen trees at garden centers now that are like, you know, two feet tall, not super big. And if you keep it in a container, especially if it's already a dwarf variety, that's not going to grow super quickly. It's going to grow to what it can grow to. So you could keep it in there and rotate out your outside, um, your fillers and your spillers and have a, an evergreen. Canna lilies. I have some pictures of some with canna lilies are great for this time of year. For your thriller. They're just tall and the leaves are pretty. So even if they're not blooming, you'll have like that tropical leaf and really just anything with enough height compared to your others. You're just looking for something to be the tallest in the middle. There's no like hard and fast rule. Like these really long stemmed things are pretty, but you could put like a hookara in the middle and let it um, like a coral bell and let it um, be the middle because they put up little bloom spikes and they get really full. Then you have your like middle range of your planter. So if you're thinking if you plant something in the middle, then we're going to do the next ring out is your filler. And um, usually this is something that flowers, um, has a nice texture maybe. If it doesn't flower, it might have really interesting foliage. Um, this has some sort of aster in it, but like pansies are usually used in this regard in the spring and the fall. Um, petunias would work right now. Um, coleus, we saw the, the one earlier. Where it was, yeah. So this is coleus and they come in like a zillion different colors now. They're really pretty. Um, and they just have really interesting foliage uh like that one's purple but there's like all shades of lime green and yellow and coppery and they mix them together and like they can really add a lot of interest and since it's the leaves and not the blooms that's really going to last you color wise throughout the season um it's not like it's going to bloom and then it'll be done blooming but they are only they are annuals and they're not cold hardy so they're only going to be and they don't love the hot hot so like in your full sun planter, it's not going to love it, but you could keep a coleus. Like I have a coleus planter near my front porch where I just get like a little, doesn't get a lot of direct sun, just a lot of bright indirect light. And they're fine right now because they aren't baking. Um, all right, let's get back. All right. So we talked about different kinds of fillers and the purpose of that. And then the outer ring in your pot, if it, well, even if it's a square pot, but the outer ring of plantings in your pot is going to be your spiller. And this is stuff that's going to trail over the side and soften the edge of your pot and um, have that cool, like creepy, traily um, element. And Creeping Jenny, that's what this nice light green is right here. Um, creeping Jenny is a really commonly used one. It does well all through the yeah it does well all through the growing season spring to fall yeah it can also grow all over your yard um it's fairly easy to get up compared to other things um so I like it a lot um I've let it kind of creep into my yard as well but it, it it's a really great one because it uh, a lot there's a just a regular green there's this really, the most popular is this like yellowy, limey green creeping Jenny. But I just found 
they have like a chocolate colored one. They were selling it at the last plant sale here. That's like a more purpley. I haven't gotten that one to like take off for me yet, but that I think is really cool sounding. So creeping Jenny is a really good one. You could also use petunias as a spiller because petunias get really like long and leggy and they will trail down out of your um, pot. And that'll give you blooms on your spiller. Sedums. So sedums are like the little succulent plants that like to trail along. They do really well as a spiller. Um, herbs. herbs, yeah. Like you could get creeping thyme. There's a creep, oregano's mints. There are, um, there's even a creeping rosemary like that is, that is more prostrate and it can. So those would all be for the lady in the back that was asking about, um, something in a hot, hot, all of, a lot of your perennial herbs, um, they're native to like hot and dry. So they're going to do great in a container, um, in the summertime here. They may not do great in the ground because <laughs> it's too hot. It's too humid, <laughs> but they, they do well in a container. And so like, um, she was saying you could do, uh, you could do like a rosemary in the middle. They even have some that are a more tree form. And then you could do lavender and oregano and all of those kind of herbs. And then you would have something that would smell wonderful too when you like brush by it. Um, and something that would do well in the heat as, as, as well. They all, like all of those like rosemaries and lavenders, they have like pretty silvy, kind of silvery foliage too. So they have interesting textures. So those are all things to like think about when you're combining stuff. So usually if you're for the most interest, you want like a different texture for each plant and a different color a little bit, just so you have some variation. I thought this one was really interesting because it's a lot of stuff you wouldn't think about putting together. It's got like, this is a, the thriller in this one is, is a type of papyrus kind of plant. So that would be a, a perennial. Um, so it's a grass. And then I think these are cosmos. You think those are in the middle, the sweet little pink ones. And then it looks like we've got maybe dianthus and creeping Jenny as our like lower component to spill over. Um, I will say I like to put a lot of things in, in, in planters thinking that the rabbits will leave them alone. Not this year. The bunny crop is top notch this year. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one are they are they really it's bad this year yeah, I know. yeah there's a bunch of them he's checking on them oh they're doing great this year and i think it's not just like right around here i've checked with like my in-laws that are in a different part of the state and it's just been a good year for bunnies there's just lots of them and we have one of those door cams on the front of our door and you can see them like they come up the steps because I have planters down the steps that come up the steps and put their little feet on the planters. And so that's something else to think about, unfortunately, <laughs> is if you're going to have like deer or bunnies eating on your planters, they won't eat herbs. No, usually no, nobody eats the herbs. So if you do have like a deer or bunny problem. So oh, they, they've eaten all of my zinnias this year zinnias cone flowers they like sedum it's like got water in it so think about where your planter is and if there's bunnies you might have to put a little fence around it or something i don't know i've never had to deal with them like i have this year it's been really they're cute but they're yeah the, yes yes it was just a good year for bunnies all around Let's see. And then I just have some more examples of types of things you can do. And then we can go on and answer any planter questions um, that you guys might have. So this is an example, not very big yet, but this is a canna in the middle. So it's going to keep getting bigger through the growing season and it'll have beautiful blooms at the top. But they filled in with like, these are petunias trailing around the edge. Um, does this have a, oh, it does. Aha. It's a laser pointer. 
So this one back here, this little like spiky one back here, that's a hookera. Um, these are very big planters. These remind me of the ones over at like um, Cameron Village. They have really nice view. That's a good place to go for inspiration. Town of Cary has some beautiful planters around downtown too. If you want inspiration, like just all over the steps of their art center, they have some beautiful planters and they use a lot of like small conifers that almost have like a bonsai quality and stick stuff in with them. It's really, really pretty. So this is, so this is the kind of size planter where you could definitely bump it up at the bottom. Like you definitely <laughs> wouldn't want to put that much soil that would fit in a planter that size all the way to the bottom. And these are some really cool mixes of texture. So this is a different canna over here. And like, even when this one's not blooming, look at the foliage on that one. It's got really interesting variegated foliage. Um, cannas are tropical. And for the past several years, at least in the ground, I don't, uh, they may not in a pot, but in the ground, my cannas have been coming back just fine here. Um, and what you could do if you wanted to overwinter one in a container is like I said, stick it, stick it over near where your heating unit ha like has its exhaust or cause it can be like 10 degrees cooler there or warmer there in the winter time. Like the colder it is outside, the more that's gonna be running. So it'll, it'll help keep those things. Cause you don't, you just need it to not freeze um, in the pot but this one's a canna and they used pansies as the filler and the spiller. They just did a bunch of them. So like, it doesn't have to be all different kinds of plants. And this one's really interesting. It's got an ornamental cabbage and this must be more, this would be more of a spring or fall type planter. Um, Cause that's just when those would grow best. Like in the summertime, the pansies would poop. And the ornamental cabbage would bolt and get really tall and wild on you. But that would be a good spring or fall. And then we have to definitely mention the ornamental sweet potato right here. These uh, green ones. Those are all the ornamental sweet potato varieties were developed at NC State. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, it's a little uh, kind of a, they're, they're like a side effect of their sweet potato breeding program. They're always like working on uh, edible sweet potatoes to, to help with, with crops and disease prevention. And in the um, genetics they were doing and the breeding they were doing for that, they started getting some plants that had interesting, you know, when you're doing crosses like that, you, you get to select your favorites. But if you start selecting for something different, like, oh, that one has pretty leaves. So they, they started a whole ornamental program just by something they found in their edibles program. So any of the, if you, if you see any pretty ornamental sweet potatoes, just know that it was developed at NC State because they all started, they all started here. Um, so that'll be, that would be like an annual that you could use all through the growing season. Like right now, you could start it in the spring and go all the way through the fall with a ornamental sweet potato. Um, and they'll trail really nicely. They have purples, they have cut leaf ones with really cool, uh, jagged edges. Uh, this looks like Tradescantia, this purple, which is more of a tropical plant. People use it as a house plant a lot. It would trail a little bit as well. Um, so that's another option for an outdoor planter in like the summertime. If you're not going to have full sun, if it's going to be more of like your porch, your shaded porch or something like that, you could use something that would be a good tropical house plant. That's where all of mine live in the summertime is on my covered front porch because they get bright, direct light. Most of those things that are sold as houseplants are tropicals that grow in the understory of like jungles. <laughs> so that's what they want. They want bright, indirect. Light. They're not used to full sun. Like if you take your Monstera or your tray to scantia and you stick it out in afternoon sun, it's not going to like that, but they love the heat. They like the humidity here. So if you've got like a shady porch, that's still going to be bright, just not directly bright. You could do a mixed planter of house plants. That's really, and it, it, it would hold up really well. 
Um, and then this also had the cosmos in the top, which is lacy. I like this a lot because the texture is all very different. I like that lacy one. Here's some other big plant ideas. There's a alocasia. So that's a, another like tropical. It would do great this time of year. They usually sell the bulb in the spring. You could just like plunk it in the middle of your planter and go ahead and put some things in for the spring. And then it could come up as it warmed up and fill in. And they can get really huge and be really exciting. Um, what is that? That looks like Hedicium. The ginger lily? The ginger lily, um, which is kind of related uh, to the ginger we would eat too. But um, it's kind of along the same lines of a cantaloupe as far as how it would grow, how you could treat it. Um, and it, there's some, I think that's coleus right there. It's really purple. That's pretty. And then this one, they even have a palm. Um, most palms are not going to be cold hardy, but, you know, if you're going to bring it in during the winter, you could do something like a palm. And then they just have, this look like marigolds and petunias and ornamental sweet potatoes. But, um, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. And I, I would love to discuss um, what you guys are trying to design for. Like if there's a specific space that you're trying to make work. Um, is there anybody that has, are there any questions online? Okay. Oh, that'd be great. That would be easier. Cause I know, okay. Okay, I'll just come stand near you. So I don't think they're not seeing me anyway, are they? They're just seeing the. They can see a little bit. A little bit. I have okay. A front door planter, a plastic urn, and I okay. put the creeping Jenny in it. Okay. And then I put um, geraniums. But okay. is, is there a fight between some plants because the creeping Jenny is doing great, but the um, but the geraniums aren't growing as quickly. So is there a fight for the? For the nutrients. Oh, you mean like space. the resources? Yeah, because uh, I'm in a planter like not. that. Um, so she's wanting to know if like her geraniums are not doing as well as her creeping Jenny, if um, they could be fighting for nutrients and that's why they're not doing as well. I would say in that case, creeping Jenny is just going to grow. <laughs> so I, and I really don't think that the creeping Jenny is going to be like stealing a lot of nutrients. Um, so when it comes to plant selections, is there a, you know, do you need to be aware For a seasonal that? planter that you are going to switch out in a couple months, it really shouldn't make a huge difference as long as you're keeping it watered when it should be. Um, and you've put a good soil mix that's already got some nutri nutrition in it. Um, I will say when it comes to, um, the way you plant things makes a difference. So I, I really like when you're going to put plants that you've bought into potting soil like that, they're going into soil that's going to be sort of similar to what they were growing in. So that's already helping you. Um, it can be a lot trickier to plant things in the ground when something's been growing in like this really loose nutrient, you know, material that they've put lots of nutrients through. And then you got to go put it in our red clay. Like that's a little, the things you have to do are a little different to help that plant thrive. But if you're going from a substrate that's really similar to what it was growing in, um, my biggest concern wouldn't be knocking the soil off of the plants, but you need to loosen those roots up, especially if you pull that plant out and they're like all wound up in there. It's okay to be a little brutal because if you just leave it, it's going to keep being, yeah, just chop it off. I know I'm really brutal. My husband's like, is that okay? I'm like, it's fine. Uh, Cause a lot of times I'll either like, if it's, if it's got like a, a disc of root at the bottom, I'll like cut that disc part off where it's really thick. You just have to make sure you're watering it well. Cause it'll make, if it's an annual, especially it's a grower. So it's going to make new roots fairly quickly. But if you leave those wound roots in there, 
it's going to be hard to keep it well watered. Those roots aren't going to explore and go out like they should. It's going to keep trying to like grow in on itself. And um, so I would, that could be a little bit of your problem is maybe you didn't loosen up the geraniums enough, but some plants just don't care. Like the creeping Jenny, like it's going to grow when you forget to water it. It might look a little sad and then you'll water it and be like, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks. <laughs> that one more for you. Okay. Uh, for Christmas, um, my son gave me one of those, um, I think they're called rubber tree. They're very popular right now for indoor plants. Okay. The tall ones with the big, you know, leaves. Oh, I know what you're grass. talking about. A diff, diff, yeah, they're, Diffenbachia, they're, maybe? They're, it's, I've always called it big or rubber. It's not a shiny. Oh, leaf. oh, it's, it is a, a ficus. Is they're it, um, big, fat. Yes, it is. I know what you're talking about. Well, it is a type of ficus. It's yes. Like this big. And so it, it was growing. So I had a pretty container that ceramic but with no drainage. Oh. And I was like, I'm used to drainage, but it's pretty a bit for the next step up. But is there any case, why would you ever buy a container that doesn't have drainage? A lot of people. Well, the way that they are used, because I wondered that for a long time until I really got into doing house plants. Mm -hmm. And if you're indoors, you don't want water free draining over your wherever. Yeah. Um, so get a pretty ornamental planter like that. And then just put it in like a plastic pot it up in like a plastic grower pot or anything, you know, like I keep it out. Yeah. So when it's time to water it, you could still water it while it's inside that planter if you want, or you can take it over to the sink. But then that way you can lift it and let it drain, pour off the extra water. And because you really need in pots, plants build up salts and um, things that uh, if they don't drain, especially it will build up salts. And uh, it, it, eventually that soil is just like not good anymore. getting brown spots on the leaves. So then I took it outside on the patio, opened up my umbrella, and set all my indoor plants outside. That's a good spot. And watered them, kind of let them breathe outside. But that I hate, I hate to do the one that was my gift in. By I think I just need to get like you said. Yeah. So if it's if you really love a planter that has no hole in it, if it's something you could make a hole in feasibly, do that. But if not, just, I always keep, especially if they're like bigger pots, like if I've bought something that just come in one of those black plastic landscaping pots, I keep them because they have amazing drainage because they had them in a greenhouse or a nursery where they, where their technique is like lots of drainage, feed them a lot, put a lot of water through them. Um, they have amazing drainage and if you, if it will fit into one of your decorative planters, then that pot can do the job of like keeping the plant happy, but then you can sit the not very pretty pot inside the pretty planter. And then you don't have to, and I mean, you could do that with these mixed planters. If you had just like, if you had a cool wooden half barrel that you wanted to plant something in, instead of planting directly into the wooden barrel, that's eventually going to rot because you've got soil and stuff in it. It's going to have a much longer life if you got a big plastic planter pot and put your mix of flowers in there and then set it inside. Especially if you have a trailing, your your spillers they're going to they're going to cover any little sections that you might be able to see down in, and then then you could still pull it out if you need to and check on things and it'll drain and stuff. So. We did get a question online from Lennox McClendon asking, so how often should you water planters? Okay, so it really <laughs> depends on um, how big it is, what kind of plants you have in it, how much sun it's in. So you have, to, you have to check on it, basically, and get a feel for how much your planter needs water. Um, I feel like, frankly, if it's in the sun right now, you could water it every day. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I have planters in the shade 
And I only need to check on them like once a week if it's a shade planter, even right now. Um, if it hasn't been raining, like as a gardener, you get really tuned in. <laughs> Yeah, and you can also look at them. If they're starting to look droopy and sad, make sure you water them. And when you water something, don't just go and make sure the top of the soil is wet. Like you stand there and you you wait till there's just water coming out the bottom. You like make sure, because like I said, those, those uh, moisture um, components in your soil that help retain moisture, once they dry completely out, which it's easy to do right now, um, like that's why our ground is cracked. Clay holds moisture really well, but once the moisture's out, it's hard to get it back in. So, um, if, if you do have a pot that gets super dry, like give it a really good soak. If you've got drainage, you can't overwater it. If it's outside in the sun, like, unless you just literally plug the hole and left a hose on it. So, um, the best thing you can do is you just have to check if it's in the sun and it's the summertime, I would just keep an eye on it every day. It might be every day or every other day this time of year. If it's a sun planter. Let's say you did what you said with your good garnsel and your perlite and you got your plants started in this huge planter and they were great. And five years from now, you got the same soil in that planter. How do you refresh Without Oof. emptying the plant, can you do that? You get if you need to refresh it. Yeah, you got to dump it. It's I know it's hard. Let's say you're not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what you could do is replace some of it. Like if you don't want to have to like dump this giant planter, if you are you planning on replacing the plants as well? I replace the plants, pull them out every fall. Oh, okay. I understand. The soil, the soil hasn't changed. Right. Um, well, what I would do is if you're, if you're doing a refresh, cause it hasn't been, cause even in a pot that drains, um, outside is better because they free drain. Mm -hmm. So the salts don't build up so bad in it. Cause the water that's coming through is going away. Like indoor pots can be a real problem because you put them in a saucer. And unless you're, small enough to dump and yeah, yeah. But like, there's a difference between letting it drain into a saucer where it's going to sit and letting it drain and flow away, like in a sink or outside. Like it, if you, if it's outside where water is flowing freely, those salts are washing through, they're not building up. But like, if you're watering a house plant or even an outdoor plant that you keep in a saucer, it doesn't flow quickly unless you're like, if it's really big, you're not dumping the saucer when it gets full. You're just kind of letting it soak back up into the plant. And that's where you really start seeing salt buildup problems. So you probably could do three years and it'd be fine. But to replace that, what I would do is when it's time to pull out the plants that are in it, I would take like half that soil out and just put new soil in and see if you couldn't mix it like if you don't want to have to do all of it you know like that's a lot yeah and i leave that creeping jenny i mean it's beautiful it it, yeah it, I <laughs> it is a very hardy little ornamental plant yeah how can you tell there's a salt buildup um the brown spots that you um you also see white on the white inside. yeah you'll see it'll literally look like there's salt in the pot it'll get like this white white crusty if you have clay pots um like porous clay pots that aren't glazed it'll get it on the outside which is pretty like they sell pots that are really old in England that have developed this patina for like hundreds of dollars just because they yeah it's cool yeah what did you say? Because of the salt design? Yeah, because of the patina that the salt design made on it and created. Yeah. But to clear that up, take the soil out and start. Pressing. Yeah, if you've got a bad salt buildup. Um, and if even if it's on the pot, it's not necessarily bad. But if your plant starts getting like crispy well, tips, yeah. that's a really good indicator that it's like a salt or a mineral issue of some sort. Um, it's a lily I've had for almost 30 years. Oh, is it like a peace lily? It just needs some new soil. That's that's probably, and I would think that it would, it should repot fairly. 
Unless it's super pot bound, that's true. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's not doing, it's not the right, mine's not the right. Well, and if something you don't want, a lot of people tend to go, well, I could go ahead and put it in a bigger pot. And for the longest time, I always thought that like the biggest thing you could put it in was the best, but that's not the case. Cause what happens is if you put a plant in a pot that is much bigger than it, the water's going to stick around for too long in the soil compared to what that plant can drink. And you're likely to run into like rot issues and um, just things like that. So like, look at the, if you have something in a pot, look at the roots. If they're like really starting to make that spiral, like I said, it's ready to move up. Like if it's a single house plant, like you were talking about, it's ready to move up. But if you pull it out and there's only like this little root ball and all the soil, you got it in a pot that's too big. It's probably staying too wet. Um, and like I said, feel free to fill plants. This is how you learn these things. <laughs> One more question for you. I, I made food and they donated um, peonies to me. Got a couple of peonies. Oh, peonies. I yes. I love them. They're like truly my favorite. So they bloom for a couple of weeks and then they're done. But the plants are pretty. Yes. But I've noticed they're there again. Um, they're starting to get little spots on them. So at what point do you trim the peonies plant itself down? Do you wait till fall or do you go ahead and so after they bloom? At that point, you I you want to leave leaves for because that's how they're taking in nutrients to grow up energy for the next year's blooms. But if it has some leaves that aren't your favorite, you can cut those off. It's fine. I tend to go ahead and cut the seed heads off my peonies so they're not wasting energy on create, making seed. Because you're not trying to grow peonies from seed. They would take years <laughs> to become another peony because they're a perennial plant. It's not like an annual that you could seed everywhere and then you'd have a bunch next year it would have to grow for years before it would even start blooming. So I go ahead and once they're done blooming and start making a seed head, I cut those off. Um, but what I do is if you have a few spotty ones, you can go ahead and cut those. I wouldn't cut it off at the ground until it starts to die back. Like it's gonna, there's a difference between like getting some spots and then you'll know when it's done. It'll start just being done for the year. <laughs> It'll get brown and, um, once it's basically, if, if you want to have really good blooms next year, you want, you do want to try to leave that so it can take it as much energy as it can to store. Peonies have like these big tubery roots that um, are storage structures for that. So they, they leaves that are still going after it blooms are taking in energy to make next year's blooms. So you just don't want to do it too early. Yeah. Yeah. My dear. Yes. I've seen ants moving from one potted plant to another one, like carrying their little white eggs <laughs> or something. You know, it was weird. Like you get bugs in a pot outside. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has seen that, but, you know, you can get other things that like your plant too and live with yes. it. Yes. Ants and, are fine. And, they, and they're I, not and doing I anything. They, they went from this one to that one. So that's good. Uh, and uh, to echo your pot with one hole. I had a favorite uh, plant that was growing on my pergola and I came home, I'd been gone and it was just wet. Well, it had, the root had grown through the one hole. Oh, I've had that happen too. Locked it up. So I came back with the drill. It was one of those half plastic uh, like barrel, barrel things. Yeah. So I said, okay, I got a new, I loved it so much. I got a new one, but I said, here, try to go through one of these, you know, gave it, gave it some more places to grow. Yeah. That's the, that's why I like to have more than one drainage hole because like a root can fill if there's yeah. just one, especially if it's not super huge, a root could just be like, ah, I'm so happy. And then it fills it up. You never, I mean, life will find a way. And I remember I was in Bryce Lane's class. And I have a lot of Japanese maples in pots outside. I don't want them to get bigger. I right plant them. But he said, you know, you can take them out and then just trim the roots, give them some fresh soil. And if, if they look really good in the pot, it's kind of sort of pseudo bonsai maybe. Yeah, something. yeah. You can keep plants in a pot. I love trees. I like, I love that. ornamental trees. I have no more space for ornamental <laughs> trees at my house. So I still get them and I put, I keep them in pots. 
and like near my front porch. That was guilty. I'm but you do guilty. have to yeah. do that every now and then. Like I had a Norfolk pine that looked wonderful, and I hadn't touched it for ten years, and I was guilted. Like they say, every, every yeah, time yeah. You should think <laughs> about what's going on. Feed it. Change the soil in there. I'm like oh, yeah. And then eventually, it kind of eh, you know it went away, but it was good. I have one more thought on hanging plants. Oh, you know, hanging baskets. I saw one tip one time. You know, because you got the coconut, the the, poor, the husks, yep. and then you need the, some landscape to keep it in. But they are just needing the water. So we said to put a diaper in the bottom of it. <laughs> what? It was. I don't know if anybody had done that. I have never heard you that. Have something absorbent that can hold a little more water, and you can hide it inside the. So you wouldn't. See. That's actually not a bad you idea. I've heard of that. Give your, you know, hanging plants. Give it something. Because diapers do it. like wick the moisture in so it wouldn't be like sitting in it no no i wouldn't i wouldn't think so on the outside highly sunny you know just it's you can look online and find all kinds of tips but the pretty good stuff happens. hanging planters are like a different animal because they dry out so fast like if you it really you really have to water them you can do drip irrigation well that's what they do here um while you guys are here there's um, the annual trial beds, but there are, is a section for hanging planters that they're trialing. So you could go see those, but you can see they went, they have, they, it's in full sun, you know, like it's even worse than what we would expect or it'd be hanging under a porch. So um, they have drip irrigation set up for the lines. It's, it's hard unless you don't go anywhere <laughs> in the summertime. <laughs> That's my biggest problem in the summertime. It's like if we go somewhere for a week, like, and nobody's watering, then you're like, wow. Well, you yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And, like, here's your, here's your bottle <laughs> and one or two holes in it. Yeah, or have a neighbor come and check on them. But like, that's what tends to get me is like, some things do need to be watered pretty frequently if that's what you want <laughs> and, you move them to the shade. or move them to the shade. I've done that before where I just, if I know I'm going to be gone a week or two, I'll just move things, especially if it's not ornamental and it's just like, I'm trying to keep this little tree alive that I was going to plant somewhere. I'll just move it in the shade. I've seen a lot of powdery mildew already this year in my garden. Really bad. Once it's once it's all over your plant, you just kind of have to cut it off. Um, and powdery mildew is like it's because we're hot and humid. It's like this. But I've never had it before. I had it in New Jersey. Hollyhocks. Every year. Oh, my hollyhocks look awful this year. <laughs> so I said, "Okay, hey, you coming out? You know, I'm not doing you anymore." But these are the. Uh, the Indian heads, where the flowers, the Indian, the, um, they're yellow and they're red. Um, what's the type red. of red? The blanket flower. Yeah, oh, the blanket oh, oh flower. Galardia. It's on the, oh, yeah. it is Galardia. It is Galardia. But, but it's on them. I can't stand it. I've got and it. I'm going, okay. So I started looking up in our book. I looked up. On I think the it's just the weather bed. we've had this year um, more than anything. Yeah, it's been it's rough. Awful. My, um, I have like tall rubecchias, the really tall yeah. ones, and the leaves look pitiful. They're like covered in power. My hollyhock had like. But away from that, yeah. this is in the front of my house. In the side, I have a whole garden that is yeah. uh, sort of for, uh, has over cover, a cover for the, uh, from the sun for a lot of plants. And they don't have water. They don't have power mildew. It tends to be the stuff that's in the sun. I think they get heat stressed. So mad. I think they get heat stressed in the sun and then it makes them more um, susceptible to it. And then it's also really humid, which is the perfect well, environment. Because bees are on, they're on these asters that are right next to this. And they're also getting the powdery mildew and the bees love it. I mean, they just hang out. So I don't want to take right. their right. habitat. Because some of my bee balm is even even yeah. starting to get it. I mean, the best. What I did with my, I had some hollyhock, 
And I just started taking the big lower leaves that looked really bad off because just to try to help minimize it from spreading. I had it for years in New Jersey. It would just wouldn't go away. Well, it's just, it, it's not going to go away. because It's just in the environment. We just have particularly good environment for it this summer because I've, yeah. I've had like zinnias, it's already on my zinnias. And oh, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I planted a few and then the bunnies ate them anyway, even though they have powdery mildew on them. But <laughs> it's on my rudbeckia, it's on my um, hollyhock. Okay, so it's it's general this year. It's I've just, never had it yeah, ever. You're, not alone. you're not alone. You're not alone. Okay, it's just, yeah. it's just environmental this year. It's just been really good year so for I'll it to tell grow. My neighbors, let it go. Yeah, it's let just, it just live, yeah. If, if it's done blooming, like what I did is I was so sad because the leaves already look really bad on this. It's Rebecca Maxima. So it's the one that's like really tall stalks that have the really pointy center and it has yellow petals. And so they're really tall. They tend to flop sometimes anyway. And the leaves already looked really bad at the base because of the powdery mildew. And then we had that storm like the week before last. And they were almost ready to bloom and every single one of them like broke over. <laughs> and I was like, ah. <laughs> so I just chopped it all to the ground. I was like, maybe it'll refresh by the end of the summer. <laughs> I put some bungees around or a garden wire because like my pillow fell over. Yeah. You know, just yeah. things just get heavy. So it's kind of, kind of interesting to do that. I just don't like the powdery mildew. The powdery mildew is hard because there's not a good way Especially well, or, ornamentally said, to I deal with it. Right. And then I said, okay, they don't have really a good solution here. There's, <laughs> there's really it's reality. You just it's can't. reality. Good airflow. But, yeah. you know, if you've got a full garden, you can't necessarily. Well, it has, I have good flow. It's just been, it's just, just like okay, the bunnies. Okay. It's been a good year for powdery mildew. There's <laughs> one more comment while he's here with the mic. I have a friend that every winter, she's very a great gardener she washes all her pots she's in a zone five with that one that 10 percent uh chlorine solution yes so she just eliminates any risk of overwintering any kind of i've never really had a problem but do you have any thoughts that is cleaning um pots? and that's what they do like i've done work at the research station before and like here when they repot something they they reuse pots but they clean them um so uh if you're gonna, especially those plastic pots, because they're really easy to sanitize. Um, what did you say? A 10% 10, 10 chlorine solution. Um, yeah, or isopropyl, you know, you can just- Or isopropyl alcohol. I've used um, Simple Green before, like they use that as a cleaning solution. Um, I've done some work at Plant Delights before, and that's what they use to sanitize. They reuse their pots, and that's what they sanitize theirs with. That's why you volunteer there too. Well, I think with yeah, all the gardeners volunteer at the same places. So, um, yes, sir. Oh, okay. So I've got a compost bin and I've been filling it up for about a year now and it's full. Okay. So at what point do you know that it's ready to use? And can you just directly take that out and mix it in with the okay. soil? So you don't want to use straight compost probably as a medium because that's just your organic component usually um and how big is your compost bin oh gosh it's huge okay uh, it's one of those do you turn it oh it turns yes, okay it turns. so um basically it's going to start looking like black mm -hmm. crumbly soil when it's ready to be incorporated into your plants um you, you don't want to have a lot of uh, like chunks, art pieces <laughs> in it anymore. <laughs> um, I don't have a, I don't do a whole lot of traditional composting because we don't have a good sunny spot to have compost in because it really does better to have that added heat. Um, but it's a, it's a portion of like you were talking about the water retention the fertilizer. yeah it's like there's your it's, soil it's there is soil as well so you probably wouldn't want to use just your compost but you you might want to mix it in with some it would be great to mix in like just with whatever 
your native soil is to really improve it. Like if you have a bed that you want to improve. Um, Were you asking put it in a pot? Or no, just okay. how, how to use it, how best to use it. For something like that, I'd probably use it like in an existing top bed dressing. as a top dressing. Just throw it on top. Just put it on top like you were going to mulch, okay. but use the compost instead. And then that way um, it'll kind of percolate down and incorporate. Yeah. I remember so. I was in Bryce Lane's class one time and he said, soil is always soil. It may not be the best, like even what we pull out of our pots that we had for five years. So you can just, don't throw it away. Just put it in a pile and mix it in with some other stuff. It's It becomes a filler or... Right. Unless and like you could, or, you could put that spent soil in, there. in with compost. Yeah. And kind of like let all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then it's suddenly been rejuvenated. You know, like if you had a compost pile, you wouldn't have to put soil. You could take out half of that soil that had been in your pot for five years and then top dress with compost and mix it together. And that would rejuvenate as far as like nutrients and stuff. So. Yay. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. And thank you guys for coming. I'm glad. I thought we might have, I tried to, I knew I would have people that like knew their plants and I was, I, I was hoping we would have all, all levels. So I'm glad that they will like help. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I did with the Rebecca. I'm hoping by cutting it off at this point that it'll just maybe grow some more. Yeah, it's like you get to. Yeah, that's what mine usually do. Were there any more questions online? There are no more questions online. Unless anybody has any more, feel free to ask them. Thank you guys for watching. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us online. I think we're going to bring this presentation to a close. Uh, be sure to go to J.C. Ralston's website to get a look at all of our upcoming events. And we're so grateful to have you here in this program. And, thank, and be sure to come back and see us again sometime.